Tonight, I'm going to start by reading a, a verse from the gospel, uh, from the from the Bible. I'm going to read it and try to speak the gospel from it. And the two words we're going to address tonight uh, are the words one and the word all. And we're going to see how those words come together in the gospel message. And you'll see that in this one verse that I'm going to read here tonight. It's found in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. If you have a Bible, you can open up to it. It's found in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. And uh, if you don't, you can listen along and maybe look it up for yourself later on. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14 says this. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The love of Christ, it, it constrains us or it compels us. That we thus judge this. These are my uh, my words tonight or my text. That if one died for all. Those are those two words, one and all. I'm going to address the word one and Matt's going to address the word all. How are they brought together in the gospel message? A unique um, take on the gospel that it's able to span vocabulary. It's able to span cultures, span continents. It's able to span time. It's the one good news message that has been proclaimed for the past 2,000 years, and it needs no improvement. It needs no addition because it is a message concerning God's son, Jesus Christ, and what he did at Calvary and how you stand to benefit eternally from what he did there. We're going to look at this message tonight. One died for all. I want to speak on this word, one. Uh, how often we pick up a dollar bill. We pick any one of our coins up or look at the great seal of the United States of America and we read that Latin term, e pluribus unum. Out of many come one, all to one. It's on our coins, it's on our seal. It's a term maybe acquainted with in Latin, maybe you didn't know what it meant in English. And so it's something uh, the world over is, is looking to, to unite these two words, all in one, but not are they done in such a glorious fashion as they are in this gospel. I want to look at the word one and look in our Bibles. What does the word one mean? Uh, what are we supposed to draw from this? Because it's such a prevalent word, uh, a term that has vast meaning in scripture. But what does the Bible have to say about one? I want to lead in with that tonight because the gospel, the gospel is preached in order that one soul might be saved tonight. We would be, we would be thrilled if more, but one soul would go from being lost to found. And so that's the significance of this message tonight. You know, the word one, it, it has that idea of, of gathering. We often pick up our Bibles and we say, I wonder where the first time that word one is used. Well, you have to go no farther than the first chapter of Genesis. And, and there you are on day three of creation. And, and it tells us there that God gathered all the waters into one place. And if it starts there with water and it starts there in creation, it is a term that is predominant throughout scripture of the fact that this one God wants to gather together individuals. Why? Because of his love for them. He wants to gather. We, 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 we often try to isolate ourselves in life. In fact, life can be summed up in that way that I just want to distance myself. I want to separate myself from the herd, from the pack, because that's how I get recognition. And yet we come to our Bible, and here's a God who is not looking to divide individuals, but to unite, to gather them. You say, how does God gather? Well, the Bible tells us this, of a God who gathers through his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, the words of the Lord Jesus, if you were to read them in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13, he says this. He says, I would have loved as a hen would gather her chickens. I would have loved to have gathered those who were lost and had no one to gather them. I would have loved to have done it. But he says about mankind, you didn't want it. So we preach tonight a God who is looking to gather souls, to unite them. One God who wants to bring them to one place, to his heaven, because of his one son. And we have here a God who wants to unite. The Bible tells us that sin has separated us because the book of Romans chapter three tells us there is none righteous no, not one. There's our word again, not one. You can't point to one person and call them righteous. You can't point to one person based on God's standard, call them good. 
But yet our Bible tells us this and tells us over and over again. Here is a God who wants to gather those that are lost. How? Through his son, Jesus Christ. The book of 1 Peter 3 and verse 18 tells us that it was the just one, his son, for the unjust, that he gave himself, the just one for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God. That he might unite us with the one creator that we have, that we've been separated from. And so this number one finds such a connection in this idea of, of unity. In fact, we read in our Bibles of a unity between the Father and the Son and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want that same unity for people here, for humanity on earth, for souls that are lost and perishing. He wants that unity for them. He wants them to be reunited. The Bible calls it reconciliation with their maker. Every soul that is born with this distance, with this chasm between them and God, you say, how does that chasm shrink? How does this distance between me and God, how does it become nothing? My friend, there is only one answer, and that is through the work of Jesus Christ when he died for our sins. The cross bridges the greatest chasm known to man and gathers people to their maker, to their God through Jesus Christ. Not only does one speak of unity, one speaks of things that are complete, things that are done. The Bible often uses this number one to speak of things that are complete. In fact, the Bible in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 says this, that this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. The Bible also tells me in the book of Romans chapter five, that it is through the obedience of one man that many can be made righteous. Bible also tells me in John 14, a verse that we love to quote, that Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father except by me. There is one solution. That is something that the world disdains to hear. I think as soon as we realize that, that, that someone has the corner on a market, that someone has a monopoly on something, our, our hearts get pent up with anger to think that anyone could control something in totality. And, and maybe that's the way you think when you hear from the Bible that there is one way, one solution, one sacrifice, one offering. But I tell you, my friend, the Bible has told us, and we read it tonight, this is because of a God who loves, a God who loved me. And as far as history tells me, there were many men who wanted to be God, but only one God that became a man. And that God who became a man, Jesus Christ, is the only man of whom it could be said that one died for all. He didn't pick and choose who he died for. He died for all. He died for sinners. He died for the ungodly. He died for the unjust. He died for the unrighteous. But he died. He died. Sometimes when we think of complete transactions, when we think of things that are, 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 are finished, we, we get a gain, a sense of security. And that's just it that the Bible wants to tell me that Salvation will not be based upon what I do, but it is based in one work that one man did in one day when for six hours on an April afternoon in the year 8033, Jesus Christ hung on a cross and died for your sins to reunite you with your maker, with your God, to reunite, to gather you because this work is complete, it stands unparalleled. Many men have given 10-step programs and, and ways to get closer to God. But this God did not tell you to come closer to him. He came to right to where you were. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And this work stands unique. It's one, one work, one offering, one sacrifice. In fact, if you go to the book of John chapter 5, about this God who is complete. He is a complete God. He lacks nothing. It says just that. The Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks about the Father and he speaks about himself because the Bible tells us in John chapter 10 that the Father and the Son, they are, they are one. They are united. They are the same. And the Bible tells me this, that the Father has life in himself. He doesn't depend on anyone else for his existence. Neither does Jesus Christ. He depends on no one else. The Bible tells us that that they had life in themselves. They depended on no one else. They depended on nothing else for their existence. And you say, 
When we hear of men in society who don't need anyone, who don't need anything, you know, those are dangerous men because they're aloof. They could be isolated. They could they could be self-sufficient. They have no needs of anyone. You you these men they 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 live on castles. They live in ivory palaces. They they live far away from the average man. But this God who was complete, he came to where I was. An incomplete person. You say I was an incomplete person because I did not know Jesus Christ as my savior. And this God who was complete, he came to this world to complete a work that would bring me forgiveness of sins, peace with God, and would bring me a home in heaven. Not only does this number one show up and show us of a God who wants to gather, not only does it tell me about a God who is complete and about a work who, that is complete, but the number one also speaks of things that are unique. How often do we say that? One of a kind. You never want to hear that when you're looking to replace something in your house. People say, oh, that's one of a kind. All of a sudden, the money, the money signs come up in your mind. But how great it is, if you've ever had the opportunity to own or to view, whether it's in a museum or whether it's uh, it's at some place you've gone on earth and you could say that is one of a kind, nothing like it. You know, the most famous verse in the Bible, it was in our slideshow. It tells us just that. John chapter three and verse 16, 25 immortal words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He was a unique son. He was an unprecedented person. And God gave him this unique son from his birth to his death, unique, unique, unrivaled, unparalleled, unprecedented. This man was unique because he was sinless. This man was unique because all power in heaven and earth was vested in him, and yet he was crucified in weakness. Why? Because this unique savior. His purpose for coming into this world was to do this, to seek and to save the lost. We, we, we look our whole lives over to try to do something unique, try to do something that is unique for God. We want to give him unique things. We, we, we try to offer him dollar bills, prayers, words. We offer him things from that are just so generic. Maybe today you turn to God's unique provision in his son, Jesus Christ, and realize this, that one died for all. More than that, Jesus Christ died for you. If you were the only soul who ever lived, if planet Earth had a population of one, heaven would have given everything it had. It would have given God's son in order to save your soul. Realize how precious is your soul, and you only have one. Entrust it to no one else other than the man who came into the world to save your soul. And as our words say, one died for all. Continue to listen to Matt as he will go through some of the beauty in that word all that we see in scripture. But be reminded, you will decide, did this man, did he die for me? Because there's a God who loved you, gave his unique son, would love to gather you home. And he did this through a completed work. One God did this. One Savior died for you. You could, on this day, know that your one destiny is heaven because of this. Continue to listen as Matt tells us about that word, all. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm going to take up that word, all, uh, with God's help. But there's one verse I want to read tonight. Uh, it's very interesting that Dave's message, and as well as my own, will uh, very go, go quite hand in hand. Uh, he quoted some of the verses that are upon my heart, but one verse, if you don't remember anything else that I've said tonight, remember these words in Romans in chapter five and verse six. And I'm just reading from a Bible here. Uh, verse six says this, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So when we speak about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we are speaking about one sin separating all humanity from God. We're speaking about one light, that's Christ, who shined into all darkness. We're speaking about one sacrifice for all sins, that's through the person of Christ on a rugged cross. We're speaking through about one Godhead for all sinners, and that's Jesus Christ who came to this earth, God in flesh, and he went to a cross sinless and spotless as the substitute, as the sacrifice 
for sinners. And we're speaking about one savior for all mankind. When you use that word all, uh, it was very interesting as I was searching certain commentaries and uh, it, there's a man named Eric Hankins in 2013. He made a mistake when he was speaking. He said this, when asked the question what all meant, he said in scripture, he said all means all and that's all all means. It's actually inaccurate theology. When you think of the word all, sometimes you and I would say these words. You have to look at it in its particular context. And we're going to jump into that in Romans in chapter 3 and Romans in chapter 5 where we just read. Sometimes we say, and maybe you're on the call today, and you said, well, all of them at that church act like this. Or maybe all of those kids over there act like this. It's actually not true. Uh, take it in its context. Maybe you're speaking about a particular group of people or a particular family or when Paul's speaking here in Romans in chapter 3, when Paul says this in its context, he says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul is saying this. When you think of the word all, Paul is saying this. He is speaking of all humanity since creation. God created Adam and Eve, and in the garden they sinned, and were wherefore as by death passed upon all men, that for all have sinned, that death passed upon all men. So God is saying this or Paul is saying this rather in Romans in chapter 23, and he's speaking about all humanity. Paul is not speaking about all angels of sin. That's not true. Paul is certainly not speaking about Christ who have sinned, because if you took that word all, you would take everything that you think about and you'd pack it into the word all. He's not talking about that. He's talking about humanity. He's talking about you and I. And in its context, if you look back at Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, in the same context as all have sinned, or all as far as humanity has sinned, before a thrice holy God. He says these words in, in verse 10 and verse 11 and right through verse 19. He says, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that seeks after God. That none is the same none as in all. There's none out of humanity that seeks after God. All, he says in verse 12, are gone out of the way. They're together in that lump of all, unprofitable. There's none that does good. No, not one. Verse 13, he continues in Romans in chapter 3 here. And I'm just looking at scripture. He says, their throats are as an open sepulcher. You say, oh, man, that's strong language. And it is. He says, with their tongues, they have used deceit. Poison of asps is under their lips. This thought of all again, humanity, fallen short of God's glory. Whose all again mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet, again, all feet, are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are, are or in all their ways, as it were. The way of peace, they've all not known. Get it? All. There is no fear of God before all their eyes. And then he continues in verse 19. And I love this particular verse because it takes all of humanity, regardless of where, you're com where you come from, regardless of your pedigree, your family name, what church you belong to, where you went to school, regardless of how financially wealthy you are. It doesn't matter. He's saying this. Now we all know or we know, but all, that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every or all mouths may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Those guilty are all. It's the same words that Christ is speaking about here when he says, Christ died for the ungodly. If there's five words I want you to never forget today, never forget these words, that Christ, that when we were yet without strength, in due time, in God's timing, in flawless timing, Christ, that's who Dave spoke about, the one, died for us, the ungodly. I met with a dear individual a few years ago, and he was struggling, a man in his early 20s, and uh, he just wasn't sure what his purpose was in life, and kind of really at, light, at, at the end of life, if you want to picture that. It was a very dark time in his life, and he, he said these words, can you read something from the Bible? And so I did. I read, actually, uh, in Romans 5. God commends his love or demonstrates his love toward us that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, can you, can you continue reading? And so we read Romans chapter three together. None righteous, no, not one. None understands, none that seeks after God. All gone out of the way, become unprofitable. And we continue going on. And he sort of sat there indifferent until I came to this verse. And I read with you here in verse 19, he says, now, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. And this man's name was Jason. He said, stop right there. He said, those words right there, all the world, they become guilty before God. You replace my name with those words, that Jason becomes guilty before God. You know, he, I actually believe he did get saved that day. He came to understand that he that believes on the son, John chapter three and verse 36, God's word says, has 
everlasting life. That could be you on the call today. Young boy, older girl, y- younger girl, older boy. <laughs> I say boy. Older woman alike. You could be saved today. God's word is crystal clear. He that believes on the son, that's Christ, the one, has everlasting life. Maybe you're on the call today and you say, well, Matt, listen, you guys could preach it. You could preach all night. I'll stay for every gospel meeting, but I'm really not that bad. I have kept the entire law. Maybe there's someone that bold or perhaps that even courageous. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, the first command, you think of these words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. I want you to just self-reflect here for a second. With all your soul and with all, again, this word all, your strength, all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. And actually, Jesus uses the word mind when he speaks to people later. In verse 6 of Deuteronomy, it actually continues. He says, put on your hearts this love here. Teach diligently to your children. Verse 7, speak of statues and commandments when you sit at home and when you're walking on the road. When you lie down and when you get up, you tie them as, as reminders on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Interesting, just fast forward as we jump into the New Testament. Jesus is speaking to Pharisees. And he says these words, you shall love the Lord your God. Listen to how he speaks to people because he knows their heart. He knows the pride that surrounds their heart. He says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all, again, your strength and your mind. He says, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is just like it because he knows their hearts. He says, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting. You know what Paul's saying? For when you're without strength, dear one on the call today, you and I, In our flesh, we have no strength to get to heaven on our own. We have no works that we could offer God. If we offered him everything that we have, he would turn to his son and he'd say, look at my son, Christ, who went to a cross. In due time, in God's timing, Christ died for the ungodly. You and I, as that all that have fallen short unto God's glory, we have no strength to keep the law. Only one could fulfill the law, and that was Christ. And the words I want you to never forget, again, in due time, in God's timing, Christ died for the ungodly. This law, all throughout the one who could fulfill the law, Christ, and the all who could not fulfill the law, spread throughout Exodus, spread throughout Leviticus, spread throughout Numbers, reiterated, added to Deuteronomy, the moral, the ceremonial, the judicial, the hundreds of laws of do this, don't do that. You know what Hebrews says? And I don't mean to quote Dave again, but you can't help it in this portion of scripture. He says this in verse 8. As he's already said these words, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them. Because people, priests would offer up sacrifice for sin. God's saying, I had no pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first and he may establish the second. That's the person of Christ on an old rugged cross. By that Will we have been sanctified, or that word, very fancy word perhaps, means set apart through the offering of the body of Christ or Jesus Christ once and for all. Why are we talking about that we have all sinned? It's because mankind uh, has a false impression of really who we are. We are sort of just in our own eyes. We're constantly making excuses for our actions. And yet Jesus Christ went to a cross to pay for sin once and forever. The one person, Christ, paid for all the sins of the world. Not that he was ever sinful, but the sins of the world were placed upon him and God rained judgment and fire from heaven on his own son on a cross. All for sins. Hebrews 10 at the end of 9 and 18, he says this, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And he continues and says, listen carefully, because this is the finished work of Christ. I love it. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never god's word not my word not dave's word this word says these sacrifices could never take away sins but this man that's jesus christ after he christ had offered one sacrifice for sins forever all sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, he continues, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified or being set apart. The Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. This is Christ's death perfecting the sanctifieds. And he says this, for after he had said before, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts. Someone's born again. And in their minds, I will write them. 
he had all their sins. Listen carefully. If you're wondering on the call and you're saying, Matt, if you only knew my sins. Dave, listen, if you only knew the heaviness of my sin, the capacity of my sin, the regret in my life, God promises this. Their sins, in verse 17, all their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Let me use it in my vernacular today in our US, our English language. It says this, all their sins and all their lawless deeds, he promises to remember them no more. And now where there is remission or where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sins. Christ came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. And Paul is communicating to Jews and Greeks alike. He's saying, for when we were yet without strength and when we were yet without any hope of our own, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. One Christ for all. I love Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 when we think of the work of the cross, paying for sins in the past, paying for sins in the, in the present, and paying for sins in the future. Save to the uttermost all that come unto him. One preacher said this, from the guttermost to the uttermost, Jesus saves. You say, well, how much sin can you save? Listen, all our lying, Christ died for. All our lusting, Christ died for. All our anger, Christ died for. All our gluttony, Christ died for. All our pride, Christ died for. All our slothfulness, Christ died for. All our envy, Christ died for. All our greed, Christ died for. All our sin, Christ died for. He says, Christ died for the ungodly. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says these words, for Christ, God's son, for Christ also suffered once for sins. All sins, the just, that's Jesus, for the unjust, that's you and I, that he, Christ, might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Can I tell you today that when we gaze at the cross, when we gaze at Calvary with eyes of faith, where Christ died, where he was buried, where he rose again, where he showed his place to other people that have seen him die on the cross, now he's risen and he shows his heart, his one heart, loves the unlovable, that's all. His one grace changes the unchangeable, that's all. His one mercy touches the untouchable, that's all. His one goodness reaches the unsavable, that's all. And his one power, listen carefully, saves the unsavable as far as man's inability to save themselves. Jesus told his disciples after he had risen, he said these words, go you into all the world, that word all again, and you preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we're trying to do tonight. Ah, you know, at times we, we do get wound up when we preach. We can't help it because this book, the Bible, is a book that supernaturally transforms lives. One has said many books inform, but only one book transforms. And God wants to, through the word of God, take your life and bring glory to his person. When a soul that's dead in their sins comes to trust in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 3 and verse 16, as Jesus is speaking to a man who thought he did well, Nicodemus, he says these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. What are the words you remember today in the last 40 seconds of my message? For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. John 3 and 36 gives you and I a promise you should never forget. He who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. A promise from the word of God is this. All who reject the son will perish. All who trust and believe in the person of Christ will enjoy the riches of Christ on earth and in heaven. Let's close in prayer today. Uh, time is up. 15 seconds left. Thank you very much for coming. I'm going to close in prayer and just make a couple of announcements and then we're good.